So this is uh, going to be a little bit different, but um, the same general direction, I would say. So um, I will talk about um, stochastic uh, hydrodynamics formulated by Landau and Lipschitz. And the question will be, are there Casimir interactions in hydrodynamics? There's a simple answer to that, and there's a complicated answer to that. And I will present both of them. So I will show you that the mean average interaction because of hydrodynamic fluctuations is zero, as we uh, expect, but that the variance is not zero, and it's very long range. So based on this, I will talk about the variance of the force, and then the correlator, force correlations, on a single plate. So I have two plates with the fluid in between and the cross-correlation uh, function. And uh, we will see what happens and what kind of uh, root mean square interactions do, do we get out of that. Because the mean uh, stress tensor on the surface is zero, this cannot be really called the Casimir effect, so I call it the uh, secondary Casimir effect as opposed to the primary Casimir effect, which is the Casimir effect we all know. Uh, and I will present reasons why actually you can use this terminology. This is the work done together with uh, several people. One of them, Bing Sui Lu, is also here. Uh, and then Christopher Monahan from Rutgers, Ali Naji, School of Physics, Tehran, uh, Ron Horgan, Dant, uh, University of Cambridge. And it just came out uh, in the beginning of this year. I will start at the beginning. This is the original. Um, Derivation by Lifshitz of uh, Lifshitz van der Waals interactions. It's based on the previous work of uh, Ritov. Ritov was interested in the fluctuations of electromagnetic field and came up with fluctuation electrodynamics based on the uh, Maxwell's equation with an addition of a fluctuating current density. And uh, for this fluctuating current density, he came up with a fluctuation dissipation theorem. I show it here in the classical form. As you see, there's no H bar in this formula. Of course, Rita formulated for the general quantum case, but I will only talk about classical physics here. So uh, why bother? Um, interestingly enough, uh, Springer recently reprinted most of Rita's book. I highly recommend them. He wrote a lot on stochastic phenomena, in particular propagation of light in disordered media and fluctuation electrodynamics and so on. Uh, there was an old translation available from some American sites, difficult to read, very poor quality, but this is now the new printing, so I recommend it. From the fluctuation electrodynamics, Lifshitz moved on to the stress tensor and calculated the average value of the stress tensor on a surface in a slab geometry. This is the formula that he derived, which you all know, uh, from this averaging. And already on this level, there is a manifest difference, as we will see, between hydrodynamics and electrodynamics. So um, in the later paper by Zeloshinsky, Lipschitz, and Vitaevsky in 61, they already talk about Casimir-like or Van der Waals-like interactions. In a, this is what they say, I just copied it. In addition to the Van der Waals forces, there is a definite contribution from sources of non-electromagnetic origin. And this is where my interest lies, uh, forces of non-electromagnetic origin. They said they're usually small, but that turned out not to be the case. They can actually be comparable, if not bigger than standard Van der Waals interactions. And when going through the non-electromagnetic uh, Van der Waals forces, they list, so these three guys list acoustic fluctuations. Actually, later on, they've been studied uh, by uh, La Raza and Leonardo in a little bit different context. They mentioned the capillary fluctuations, which I will talk a little bit more because they're connected with fluids. This was a work completed by Zandia Dow in 2004. Critical Casimir interactions was not included in the DLP list as non-electromagnetic uh, fluctuation forces, but Andrea will talk, I'm sure, more about that uh, when uh, it's his turn. Uh, then it's the liquid crystalline pseudo-Casimir interactions, also not included in their list, 
but became important later on when it was recognized that uh, liquid crystals have a critical Hamiltonian, there's no correlation line, so they could be considered as long-range correlated systems. They also show Van der Waals-like interactions. Then there's the Coulomb fluids, charged uh, classical systems, which show a type of Van der Waals interaction, a little bit more complicated. And at the end, it's the hydrodynamic interactions. There have been several attempts to calculate the fluctuation interaction interactions mediated by hydrodynamics, notably these three papers. And they came up with uh, different conclusions. They say they are long-range forces, strongest in incompressible fluids, and they can completely vanish for compressible fluids. <coughs> But the arguments used in this derivation, the derivations are strange. So first of all, we wanted to sort of clean this area to see what's reasonable, what's unreasonable, and whether there are or what are the uh, hydrodynamic fluctuation and gendered fluctuation interactions. First of all, a little bit about uh, fluid. So this is the calculation on superfluid uh, helium-4 in a layer. And you allow the lower surface to be fixed. The upper one can fluctuate. This is the kinetic energy of the superfluid. Of course, there's no viscosity, so it's easy. That's the complex order parameter, which enters the, enters the velocity. Uh, it satisfies the Laplace equation. You solve it for the boundary condition. Integrate over all the possible fluctuations of the surface, so over all <coughs> capillary fluctuations. And this is the formula you come up with. If you check the uh, Zelushinsky, Lifshitz, Mitayevsky uh, paper, it's already there with a different pre-factor, but that doesn't matter. So in fluids, in this particular case, there is a long-range Van der Waals-like interaction. But this is an ideal fluid, no viscosity. What do you do, you do in a viscous fluid? Of course, you have to start with the full nonlinear Navier-Stokes equations. Yeah, you, I hope you recognize them. And you add to them, a, in general, a fluctuating uh, external force. Uh, the fluctuation dissipation theorem gives you the correlator. For S is now the stress tensor. So what you have to consider are the stress tensor correlations. And already in this on this level, it's evident what is the main difference between hydrodynamics and electrodynamics. Uh, First of all, in hydrodynamics, the main <coughs> equation is nonlinear, whereas it's linear, Maxwell's equations, in electrodynamics. The stress tensor, however, in electrodynamics is nonlinear, it's quadratic, but it's linear in hydrodynamics. So this is a basic inversion of the formalism in two theories linear versus nonlinear, stress tensor versus the what I call the Langevin <coughs> equation because we have an external fluctuating stress. And uh, basing on uh, these equations, Jones and Chan and White calculated the forces for two spheres with no slip boundary conditions. They came up with this formula. You see that it's repulsive, goes as d to the minus 7, d is the separation, or between two flat surfaces, in the case of Chan and White, also repulsive, 1 over d to the third. They both claim, so this guy claims, with this is incompressible. With compressibility, the forces get attenuated, whereas Chan and White claim they are actually identically zero. So they used an argument based on uh, um, Lifshitz theory, where you can convert the interaction-free energy into a kind of a frequency integral, and they show that this frequency integral, as soon as you have any compressibility, limits to zero. It's a very strange derivation because for uh, in the electromagnetic field, omega goes to infinity makes sense. That's vacuum. For hydrodynamics, it doesn't. Because before you go to infinite frequency, frequencies, the theory breaks down. And this is the drawback of the formalism. So starting from scratch, again, I go back to the neighborhood of an equilibrium solution. I expand everything to the lowest order and get these two equations for the lowest order non-equilibrium solution, V1, P1. 
These are the basic equations. You see that they are linear now. I've linearized it. This goes usually under the name of landau lifshitz fluctuating electrodynamics. It's linearized because we think that thermal effects should be at most linear in the fluctuations, not nonlinear. And there are many reasons why this is uh, uh, correct. So first of all, the bulk solution. I want to get the solutions, of course, for two planar interfaces, bulk solution. I decompose the velocity into transverse and longitudinal components. I also get the T and L Green's functions. This is all well known from hydrodynamics. <coughs> I have two length scales, which also depends on the frequency. Nothing new there. I can invert that into real space. This is what I get. Transverse Green's function, longitudinal Green's function. They have some nice limits for high viscosity. This is just the Osein tensor, which we no, of course, and then low viscosity, and the same for longitudinal, where actually you have to look at the compressibility. So low compressibility, high compressibility, these are the limits. So for infinite solution, everything is clear. Now I have to do the confined solution. So I have two layers with fluid in between. I take this fluid to be water, so I take the parameters valid for water, and I see that the solution at the end depends on different dimensionless quantities, which are listed here. So the important thing is the time. Vorticity needs to diffuse a certain distance. This is the vorticity scale. And then there's a compressibility scale, which is the time that the sound wave needs to traverse a certain separation. So these are the two fundamental scales in the problem. And you can create many other quantities that depend on these two scales. And uh, then I just took the data for water, and I will get the numerical estimates for these scales, which are important in numerics. Now the crit critical step. What will I calculate? Of course, if I look at the average force or the average stress tensor on one of the surfaces, because the stresses are a linear function of fluctuating variables, they are identically zero. So there is no Casimir interaction per se. This also follows from the fact that the classical partition function can be decomposed into a configurational part and a kinetic part that integrates out. So there should be no Casimir contribution in hydrodynamics. This, was, uh, this is an argument I borrowed from uh, Meran Kardar from some years ago when we were together in uh, at the uh, KITP in Santa Barbara. So no average fluctuation interaction. However, what about the correlator? So this is usually not discussed in Casimir interactions. Now, for Casimir interactions, you can just as well calculate the variance. So here I'm showing you, this is now Casimir, so van der Waals interactions. For two media composed of dipoles, and I can calculate the average fluctuational force here, and also the variance of the force. And you will see that the variance, if I calculate this, it scales thermodynamically as the area, just as the average force does. So also for Casimir slash van der Waals effect, you can have the average value of the force and the fluctuations. These are fluctuation interactions. So not only do we have an average force, we also have a variance of the force. The force fluctuates. I will say a little bit more about that later. And then you can, of course, come up with this ratio that has a universal form. So this is the area. This is the separation. Uh, this is the function of the dielectric discontinuity only. So for Casimir interactions slash Van der Waals interactions, a force correlator or a variance also makes sense. This is not something that's specific for hydrodynamics, the way I see it. Uh, C is the force correlator. The force correlator, of course, can be for a single surface. Z and Z prime are the same. Or you take Z on one surface, Z prime on the other surface. This would be the cross correlator. So single surface correlator in force and cross correlator. And it turns out that this can be decomposed into three terms. The first one is trivial. It just comes from the fluctuating stresses. And the other two are non-trivial, and you have to calculate them through the Green's function. 
through the applications, uh, application of the Green's function. So the Green's function, you only need the longitudinal component, has this form uh, in geometry of two planar surfaces, a relatively complicated form, and of course it has to be zero on the surfaces because we uh, <laughs> use the no-slip boundary condition. This is an approximation, but a good approximation for water density, not for polymeric fluids. Uh, we can also connect together the density-density correlator and the uh, longitudinal part of the velocity correlator and calculate the force correlator. So this is what just comes up. This is the force correlator. And there are two components. One is the uh, same surface correlator and cross correlator as I said before. So you're looking at the co correlation in the force on a single surface or between the two surfaces. These are the two separate quantities that I calculate. And you get them in this scaling form. These are some universal functions, complicated functions. They depend on fre frequency integrals and have various length scales. I just listed them here. And basically, the length scale is defined by the vorticity scale and the compressibility scale that I mentioned before. So from these two scale, scales, you can derive various uh, typical frequency regimes or separation regimes. I look at uh, water, of course. Um, so this would be the physical parameters I take into account. The separation between the plates is taken in this regime. This is the propagative diffusive boundary. This is the boundary be between the vorticity regime and the compressibility regime. Uh, for water, it would be somewhere here. I take also a microscopic cutoff. This is, you have to cut the frequency integral somewhere because the uh, hydrodynamic uh, fluctuational theory, of course, has a limited range of validity in terms of uh, frequency or time scales. And shear and bulk viscosities, of course, are something also given for water and you just copy them from the book. Uh, you can look at various interesting limits. One is the incompressible fluid limit, and the other one is the Burgers limit, where you just take the uh, sound velocity propagation in zero and derive various limiting results. <coughs> so numerically, this is what you come up with. Uh, I am plotting here the same uh, surface correlator and cross-surface cor correlator. <laughs> and you see that in general, as a function of separation, this is the equal time correlator, so at the same moment. These are in general functions of the uh, spatial coordinate and the time coordinate, so I take the same time. You see that both of them decay with separation, but they decay differently. Uh, you also see that the C, so this is cross-correlator, is usually negative. Now, what I plot here, delta C is not the full um, same surface correlator. That's always positive. I just plot the excess part, which is due to hydrodynamic coupling, as opposed to pure surface stress correlations. And that can be negative. So this is something to remember. They decay with the separation, all of them. And we see when we do some analytical estimates that the decay is long range. It's usually 1 over L. So if the variance decays as 1 over L, then the root of, of the force, then the root mean square force would be 1 over square root of L. Very long range. Uh, but don't forget, of course, this is root mean square. It's not the average. Average is 0. Root mean square. Is 1 over square root of L. So this is just for different parameters. I look at the, first I do the variation of the ratio between the two viscosities, and then I do a variation in terms of U infinity. U infinity is just the frequency cutoff that I uh, use. Analytical estimates. So analytical estimates right here. Small separation limit large separation limit, <coughs> incompressible fluids. Let's look at the small separation limit. Uh, both of them, so the cross and the single plate correlators have the same form. They go as 1 over L, as you can see here. They scale as the surface area, so they have a thermodynamic scaling, and they depend on the viscosities. 1 over L. 
Now the same is observed also in the large separation limit for the cross correlator, the single grade cor correlator uh, levels off to a constant. And the constant depends on viscosities and on other parameters of the fluid, but it does not depend on separation. So this one levels off, and this one decays as 1 over L. Uh, you see that there's a minus here in the cross correlator. Minus means that the correlations are out of phase. If on one plate you have a fluctuation in this direction, on the other plate it will be in the opposite direction. Yeah? So they fluctuate like that. You could say this is in phase, but in terms of the uh, direction of the force, it's out of phase. So minus 1 over L. And as I said, from the um, correlator of the force or the variance of the force, you can construct the re root mean square uh, force, square root of the variance. And this is 1 over square root of L. Very, very long range. Yes? Independent of A. Independent of? A, A of your cutoff. No? Uh, it's right here. Ah, sorry. Yeah. That's it. Then, of course, we move on to the um, time dependence. More complicated, of course. So you have time dependence for various values of the separation between the um, surfaces. I'm showing here two different separations, these two or delta C, so this is the excess single surface correlator and the cross correlator. So single surface, 0, 0, or of course L, L is the same. And cross correlator, 0, L, or L, 0, also it's the same. So you see that in general they oscillate. The oscillation, of course, uh, not of course, but can be fitted with a uh, sign that is exponentially damped uh, for smaller values of the time argument, but then it gets, uh, I mean, you cannot fit it any, anymore with the same uh, assumption. So this is also the time dependence uh, for three different values of the separation. Delta C in this case is defined as this. So you see that they basically the cross correlations and the single surface correlation sort of frail one another, so it would be interesting to see what is the difference between the two. So the full lines and the dotted lines, if you compare them, you see that somehow they frail each other. And if you plot the difference, you will see that the difference is big at small separations, but then at, uh, so at sorry, at small separations, it's small, and as the separation gets larger, it gets larger. So, the two correlators, same surface, cross correlator, get more and more difficult, uh, different as you move to larger separations. But in general, they have the same kind of damped um, uh, sinusoidal form. So um, what are the conclusions here? Um, first conclusion is, of course, it's an important conclusion. Uh, there is no average force in this system, which is consistent with the fact that there is the decomposition of the classical partition function into a kinetic part, which does not depend on the separation or a spatial coordinate, and the configurational part, which does not contain the velocity. So indeed, the hydrodynamic Casimir effect in terms of the average value of the stress tensor is nil. It doesn't exist. The average value of the stress tensor is zero. So how come the other people got non-zero values? If you look at the details, what they do is both of them, I think, realized that on the linear level you don't get anything, so they went to the next order in the um, expansion of the Navier-Stokes equation. But in that case, it's really not clear how that couples to fluctuational part. Uh, when you derive the um, landau lifshitz fluctuational electrodynamics, the linearity of the basic equation is very important. And the whole ansatz fo follows from there. So if you don't have a linear equation, you just take a nonlinear Navier-Stokes equation and add noise to that, I'm not sure what that means. 
How do you derive that? Of course, you can always write this kind of an equation, but the question is, what does that mean? Also, thermal fluctuations are generally believed, and there are other contexts when, where that works perfectly, that they can be linearized. These are small fluctuations, except when you are close to some extraordinary phenomenon like a phase transition or something like that, when the fluctuations can become large. But generally, linearization of the fluctuation equations is correct. So both of them, both previous attempts, that use the nonlinear form of the fluctuation of the electrodynamics are probably wrong because they did not treat the nonlinearity properly. The uh, calculation which I described to you, where um, people claim that actually with compressibility the force is zero, is wrong once again, once again, because they make the assumption that the hydrodynamic equations need no cutoff; they can be extended to infinite frequencies, and that is, of course, an invalid argument. Argument you cannot do that, and that changes everything. So basically, um, the correlators, cross correlators, are long range and decay with the first inverse power of the plate separations, and the, the, um, they have a general sinusoidal dependence on the time argument. Um, and out of that, you can construct a kind of a root mean square interaction, root mean square force between two surfaces with a uh, fluctuating hydrodynamic medium in between. So I go back now to the um, force correlators. This is not something particular for hydrodynamics. You can introduce force correlators for, in general, Casimir effect, as was done by Golestanian at uh, and collaborators in 2002. However, from their calculation, which is model dependent, very model dependent, it turns out that the ratio between the average, so the average value and the variance is non-universal because it depends on the cutoff. This, I believe, is due to the fact that they used a certain type of model for the fluctuating field. If you, you, if you use, as we did with David Dean and Adrian Procedure, fluctuating dipoles, as a model, which would be a model for the Van der Waals interaction, you see that both of them, the average force and the force variance, have nice thermodynamic scaling, so they scale with the surface area, and they're perfectly finite. You don't need any other physics to get the variance. You see that the, while the average force, this is all classical, all thermal, average force goes as 1 over L to the third. This, you could say, is the zero frequency Lifshitz term. The variance goes as 1 over L to the fourth. And some universal function of deltas are delta 1, delta 2 are just the, um, the uh, dielectric mismatches at the two surfaces. So the variance of the force is something that's also present in the Lifshitz theory, though not usually invoked. I'm not sure why. But it's calculable just as the average value of the force mm -hmm. can be calculated. So. Um, if you enlarge the domain of study, not only to the average values, but also to the variance, then, of course, the hydrodynamic effect would naturally fit in, because it just so happens that it has a zero average, but it has a non-zero variance that scales thermodynamically, scales with the surface area. Why would that be important? There are many reasons why this could be important. So people are studying the um, motion of colloids, let's say, in uh, water. And uh, in many approximations, you approximate the solvent, the water, as a fluctuating hydrodynamic medium. So this is, let's say, what these people have suggested very recently. And if you do that, of course, the correlations of the force on the colloid particles become coupled and depend on the configuration of the particles. This is an uh, unexplored area and could be very interesting, in particular for the, for the um, simulation community, to be able to include this fluctuating medium interactions, the secondary Casimir effect, into their equations that, uh, that describe the time evolution of the colloidal system. I think this would be uh, pretty much it. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, yes, first question, please. 
So, uh, so if it's just a fluctuation in the force, then should I expect to get a random walk that depends on the separation between the particles? So it's yes. like an anomalous diffusion or something like that? Yeah, so this guy, Maritani, in 1999, already considered, he didn't have a reason for that, but he said, let's see what happens if the uh, correlations would be uh, coupled. And he came, so comes up with the uh, aggregation of particles, even without attractive potentials. So there might be phenomena that are heavily dependent on this kind of cross-correlations. Here's the next, here in the front, second row. Is there a correlation for force parallel to the plates? Yeah. Possibly, yeah, we didn't calculate it. Of course, the average is zero, but the yeah. correlator for the um, parallel force could be non-zero. Just didn't check it. Also, cross-correlation normal? Uh, actually, no. It has to be zero because it's a no-slip boundary condition. I think that's why it has to be. Up there. So do I do I understand correctly? But in, in both for the, for for Maxwell and for hydrodynamics, you have tested to the tensor which is quadratic in fields. But in one case, you have you have uh, fluctuations of a non-zero value. So then you have a stress tensor which is linear in fluctuations. No, no. Uh, stress tensor in hydrodynamics is linear in the fields. It's proportional to the gradient of velocity. It's not velocity squared. It's gradient of velocity and pressure. Whereas in electrodynamics, it's proportional to the gradient of the potential squared, if we just look at electric. It's different. OK, then there, up here. Here, there. Here, there. Here, there. Here, there. And um, if you get the correlations right, you can get the different equations out. I wonder if you would now also take, I mean, your force is essentially you have the amplitude and your phase or position. So why not correlating also the phase and the amplitude with the other particles? Maybe you could get the same equation out again. What do you mean by phase? So uh, we have a position as a function of time. Exactly. So you have a position as a function of time. So you said they, they oscillate forward and backward. <coughs> oh, the correlations. Yes. Yes, the correlations. Correlations, OK. Not the position. So you can do, of course, various n samples. You can do an n sample where you fix the boundaries and you look at the fluctuation of the force. You can also do an n sample where you fix the force, but look at the fluctuations mm -hmm. of the boundary. Both of them are possible. OK. And the next. So, I, so uh, I was wondering because you showed that the result, I mean, the self correlation does not depend on the distance. Yeah. And so the, this is like uh, that the one wall far in the universe will feel the presence of the other wall, even if. Uh, no, no. The single correlator you know, has a value of the correlation. <laughs> Which is independent of the se on the separation. So of a course, if, if the other effect. surface is a bulk effect, it's a bulk effect. Ah, yeah. okay, okay. You have a coupling with yeah. the bulk uh, fluid. Okay, so, so you have a single surface with half infinite bulk, and uh, <coughs> yeah, that's okay, what it is. Okay, ah. Actually, it turns out that for two surfaces, when you go to infinite separations, it's exactly two times the correlator of a single. That was precisely my question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Then it's your turn. Uh, I have a question about uh, for the electromagnetic case uh, with this uh, fluctuations of the cosmic force was uh, was shown that uh, it was possible using linear response theory to to get the force on a moving plate from the fluctuations of the cosmic force on a single plate. In this case, it's similar in the, in the sense that the average is zero, right? If you have a yeah. single plate. Yeah, it's a vacuum. Or so a I should field. quantify that. Of course, it's equal to the equilibrium pressure. But if you subtract that, it's zero. No, I mean a single plate, right? Yeah. In a, and, and then uh, you can get this uh, force on the moving plate yeah. from the fluctuation. So I wonder what you would get in the hydrodynamic case. You would get just a trivial effect or a new effect? 
Just the treat your uh, B, B schools uh, force, or so you thank, find you, thank you else. for this question. This is exactly what we're working on right now. Not only when one body is uh, moving with a velocity, but also when it's at a different temperature. This would be the full non-equilibrium thermal transfer. But that's complicated. But we're moving. Regarding the hydrodynamics, I was I remember an experiment where people observed uh, this hydrodynamic memory of a colloidal uh, particle. Yeah. So that's very interesting, also experimentally. Also. Yes. Uh, my question is: Can you do this hydrodynamic approach also for an electron fluid in a metal and complement what is known from electrodynamics with the material? I'm not sure because usually when you have non-equilibrium concept, in fact, you have to come up with a dynamic equation, some model for the dynamics. Here, you don't need the model because hydrodynamics already describes that. If your system would be describable via hydrodynamics, some kind of hydrodynamics, I guess then you would just follow the same route. But you know, there's a lot of work recently on non-equilibrium Casimir effect, which has different facets. Yeah? You, you can also have bulk non-equilibrium with its own dynamics, type A, type B, and so on. And then you calculate the uh, average force on the surface. And that's a little bit different. Along the same line, I actually have a question myself. Um, we were doing experiments with thin polymer film. So you kind of have a, a lab, a slab that is uh, air, then the polymer film, and then some substrate like silicon wafer. And we know all the details about our system, like the interfacial potential and stuff like that. We, we give all the details to people who do simulations, numerical simulations. The time scale didn't match. In the experiment, at the beginning, the dewetting was faster. And at the end, where the coalescence of the holes were there, uh, the experiments were faster and the simulation slower. What was then the simulation? What was the simulation level? was the deterministic simulation. When then all they, atom? If all atom? No, 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 sorry. Uh, just the thin film equation. When they then added noise to the system, the time scale matched. Does this compare with what? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so this, there is, the this is like an effective medium. Yeah. In, in equilibrium. So we, were, we were measuring the temperature. Yeah, you have to include the, on yeah. some level, you yeah. have to include the. Yeah. So we have the data then. I can show you. Uh -huh. Great, thank you. So, last question here. Um, just a comment on, on whoever it was that asked about uh, the, the electron fluid. Uh, there are now fully quantal hydrodynamic like ways of describing this, invented by people called um, Takatli and Vignale. And so, um, if there is an analogy, maybe this formalism is the place to look for it. Um, but I think you, know, I mean, you will certainly get the normal amount of Isles force for that. Uh -huh. it, it's, it's right. Thank you. So, thank you very much for the nice discussion.